Right. So it's time to catch up a little bit by covering deterministic travel times, which have been instrumental in all of the imaging that we've been talking about uh, ever since we have launched onto uh, you know definitely handling pre-stack depth migration through any kind of um, uh, any kind of velocity variation, and uh, I'm sure Kyle, it's uh, going to be all review for you, but um, you know have to put it into the class at some point. So um, uh, I gave this as a seminar some years ago to uh, the math department, and um, so I had to introduce them to what kind of data we're looking at. We know that. Um, we're looking at uh, th these figures are from Satish's uh, uh, thesis. Um, we're looking at uh, reflection travel times, mostly. Um, there's also the tomography problem that uh, you could call reflection time tomography, where you're, you assume you know the structure of the reflector and you're trying to recover velocity changes above it. Um, we have our uh, recordings uh, uh, of wave propagation from sources to receivers. Each of those is a seismogram. We can pick arrival times of uh, reflections or first arrivals on that, uh, on that seismogram. So as we've covered, you know, basic seismic tomography takes pick travel times of some kind of coherent phase. And I'll actually define coherency in this lecture, what I mean by that. And we use that to interpret uh, seismic velocity properties of rocks and how they change. And hopefully, uh, you know, once we have good images, we can do what uh, um, Joe is, is trying and in interpreting uh, using uh, amplitudes as well, the uh, uh, other properties, uh, maybe uh, Poisson's ratio or uh, density. So. Uh, Tomography, as, as you're going to hear um, again and again, it's a model building process. You control it with synthetic uh, forward projected times that uh, you project through uh, velocity models, and you compare those with the observed time. So you have an observed time, you subtract the uh, calculated time, project it through some velocity model, and you sum all those up, and you get a, uh, an error. And uh, let's see. This is not a. Uh, this is a uh, uh, an RMS error, I think. Okay. Now I I had hinted at this problem earlier, uh, the problem of uh, ray tracing when you have sharp boundaries and large velocity changes. And um, what I want you to consider is the problem of tracing. Array from an earthquake, maybe um, uh, at uh, at some point uh, deep in the uh, um, uh, deep in the crust, or or let's say it's a New Zealand earthquake coming from the mantle, uh, like one of those Weber one events, and you want to trace the ray uh, up to the uh, the surface where you record it with a with a receiver. And uh, I actually need to go back here. There we go. Um, so we have uh, a, uh, uh, say, a crustal layer that has a uh, depth z1. And uh, then our, uh, <coughs> maybe our earthquake is uh, some further depth z2 down below the, uh, uh, the bottom of the crust. And um, we know, uh, you know, let's say we already know where the, uh, the earthquake is, its epicenter, right? There's a, a distance x2. Uh, plus x1, <clears throat> that's just the uh, distance on the surface between the epicenter, which is over, over here somewhere, uh, sorry about that, and the, um, and the receiver, just the horizontal distance. So we know that, but we don't know how much of that big X is x1 and, and how much is, is x2. Okay. Um, we know z1, we know z2. Uh, so all we have to do is, uh, uh, is compute x1 separately from x2, and we can trace the ray. 
<clears throat> because then we know the point where it goes through the uh, the boundary. We know the structure of the boundary. Okay, so we know all these things. Okay, and um, uh, so uh, you know Snell's law says that uh, uh, the sine of the uh, of the incident angle in uh, in V one over the sine of the incident angle in the in the material with V two. Uh, so the sine of I one over sine I two is equal to V one over V two, and so then, um, you know, we can calculate x1 if we know i2. And so i2 is just this, the inverse sine of the sine of v2 over v1. OK? Um, and so then x1 is z1 over uh, the tangent of, uh, of i1. And x2 is z2 over the tangent of i2. Um, but to get any of that, we got to know i1. And we don't. You know, nowhere in here do we have I1. So we have to set up a univariate problem, and we're going to go into univariate problems as soon as I'm done with this lecture, um, and set up an objective function and iterate, you know, say with Newton's method. And uh, you know, we can use a, uh, this objective function Q uh, uh, based on I1. You know, we're iterating for, uh, to determine I1. And uh, the objective function is based on the x, uh, the actual x minus the projected, the modeled x two, uh, minus the estimated or modeled x one. Okay, both of which depend on i one. And uh, the q might be uh, the square of that. <clears throat> so we got to iterate with Newton's method just to trace a ray across one boundary. All right, and if we set up a model full of Little cubes of, of different uh, velocities, and and they can have uh, velocity changes as severe as you know what's leading to this refraction that you're seeing here, uh, you know like two to one velocity changes across one cube boundary. Um, you know then we're going to get lost in a in an enormous uh, multivariate uh, inversion problem. Um, so can you explain how that's different? I, I would I would suppose that uh, what ray bending does is is instead of uh, instead of uh, setting up the objective function um, oh oh okay so those are uh, using um, um, linear velocity gradients maybe in you know not not uh, with the gradient direction not necessarily being vertical could be in any direction. But in a linear velocity gradient, the um, the uh, the ray um, uh, describes a, uh, a circular path, okay, um, and so you you put some limits on the amount of gradient per cube in your in your model, and um, uh, and then you um, uh, you trace from uh, uh, from a known entry point, and you you uh, you calculate using the, the equation for that semicircle to the known exit point, but you can't have a sharp boundary in there. No. It's got to be smooth, right? Because if it's if it's sharp, then then sudden then, you know if you have a an infinite uh, gradient, then uh, uh, then suddenly the the ray rolls up into a tight circle, right? Um, and it breaks down. That simplification. Right, right. It's 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 an extremely it's a non-iterative way. Uh, you know, once you've once you've uh, accepted that that you have to um, you know accepted a, the the horrible limitation that you have to have a very smooth model, then you know it doesn't involve any iteration. So you um, you very simply can uh, um, uh, can compute a deterministic travel time. Just by keeping track of those exit points from one cube to the next, and and actually uh, because you have to use a linear velocity gradient, it's done a, on a usually on a series of triangles, or um, triangular tetrahedrons, I think, if you're uh, if you're uh, in three D. <clears throat> okay, so so 
the first guy to actually solve this, and you know his solution um, uh, from 1990 um, is uh, is still useful, although it does have limitations in in uh, you know it also can't allow a perfectly sharp uh, great boundary. <clears throat> But the, still, the limitations on the required smoothness are, are much less severe than uh, uh, than any of these uh, uh, ray bending uh, uh, algorithms. So um, uh, your um, uh, this is uh, uh, basically a finite difference solution to uh, the iconal equation. And uh, what we have is, is that the Vidali built up in a really very simple and heuristic way was, uh, you know, given a 3D cube in, uh, in a 3D model, okay, you have, uh, you've numbered the nodes in this way, one, let's see, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, okay? And um, uh, you, uh, you originate the... Uh, uh, you want to calculate uh, the time to each one of these uh, each one of these nodes, okay? And um, throughout the cube here, you have a uh, a constant slowness, right? And the, the dimensions of the cube are h in every direction, okay? In uh, in x, y, and z. So uh, you know the uh, the time from zero to one is just uh, hs. The time from zero to four is hs. The time from uh, from zero to five. Um, let's see. Um, you know, then you, you the time from uh, zero to five is uh, just a, uh, a hypotenuse, right? And um, so you can fill in these uh, uh, these ones. And uh, uh, but there are some um, some harder cases like uh, the uh, going from um, one corner to the other. Right, and there's this very simple uh, uh, solution that involves all the other times. Okay, so the time to seven, okay, at the opposite corner to zero, is the time at zero, whatever that is. You know, you you've traced all the way there, and um, so you have to uh, take uh, six h squared s squared, and then uh, subtract uh, these differences from the other nodes. All right. But uh, basically, you know, getting your way all the way across this uh, this cube takes one square root operation. All right. So that's the uh, the brilliance of the uh, of the uh, uh, the Dolly solution. Now, there's these other situations where you know you start at zero and you want to end up at the uh, you know maybe you have you're at an edge and um, you know, maybe you have uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, and you have 4, and you want to go um, all the way to 5. You can have, uh, over here on the right, you can have uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and you want to get 5 here, and there's other um, equations for those. So these are, these are you know, basic uh, stencils. Uh, maybe you could think of them as, uh, as uh, uh, finite difference uh, uh, stars in a way that uh, allow you in one square root operation to leap from one side of a cube to another. Uh, and so if you're um, uh, uh, in, in the simplest uh, implementation, you know, if, you're, um, if your um, model is composed of you know, some number big N of cubes, big N number of cubes, then uh, you're going to get a travel time to every every node with just big N operations. Okay, and that's uh, you know that's way less than uh, uh, ray bending uh, big N square roots. Okay, so you need square root has to be estimated via Taylor series uh, in the uh, yeah, you know by the the CPU. Um, so it's not uh, big in operations, but it's some small number times uh, <clears throat> times big n, and so uh, uh, you know, that's much less than any um, um, 
you know, any uh, 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 iterative method, you know, takes at least n squared operations and sometimes more like n cubed. Um, so uh, Vidalis was so amazingly uh, more, um, <clears throat> so amazingly uh, uh, more um, efficient that uh, you know everyone immediately uh, seismologists everywhere <laughs> immediately uh, put it to use uh, in any way they could. Um, okay, so where did this uh, solution come from? All right. Um, Here's the uh, iconal equation for travel time. You know, basically taking out the uh, the amplitude from the wave equation, just looking at the phase. So it basically says dt dx squared plus dt dy squared plus dt dt dz squared is equal to the slowness squared. Okay, and um, uh, so uh, and and you could start at the uh, uh, the seismic source. You know wherever that is, wherever its hypercenter is, and then you could progressively uh, uh, build up these uh, these uh, uh, stencil solutions, like uh, the T7 one here, to um, uh, to get your uh, um, your solution. Uh, you get your time to every point in the in the grid. Um, so, uh, for instance. Uh, um, you know, here's a uh, uh, a solution that uh, uh, takes the uh, centered uh, slowness of two cubes, and here's the center slowness of four cubes. All right, both getting a, a t five. Um, so these uh, schemes are, uh, you know, they do have errors you know, when, when compared with. Um, uh, well, it's easy to compare on a, uh, a constant velocity grid. Okay. And the um, uh, you can compare on uh, on the basis of angle, all right. So you can have a ninety degree uh, um, uh, ninety degree uh, azimuth and a uh, ninety up to a ninety degree dip in terms of the uh, the ray uh, uh, ray propagation direction, and you can see there's this area of very small error. Below uh, uh, 0.5, uh, uh, below uh, 0.15 percent. Okay, and even the larger errors are still below one percent. All right, and if you think about, uh, you know, what kinds of errors you're accepting uh, in in you know total times that uh, uh, come out of models, you know that's uh, that's just a small proportion. You know, we're often happy if we can. Uh, Come up with velocities or slownesses that are good to twenty uh, percent, right? So um, you know this this doesn't seem uh, uh, to be an insurmountable amount of error. Okay. Now these these other schemes, you know, uh, the 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 first scheme is very uh, very efficient, but the uh, the other schemes on the center the face centers are uh, are you know, can have much larger errors. So, for instance, uh, going uh, horizontally or just off vertically, they can be uh, kind of reasonable. You know, maybe uh, about one percent. Um, but um, you know, you go at the wrong azimuth or the wrong dip, and uh, you get thirty percent error. Okay, so that's uh, uh, you know that's that's too much. Um, and uh, so you want to um, um, you want to in only invoke uh, this uh, scheme C, for instance, when you're down here at uh, 90 degree dip, and uh, that's uh, one of the uh, one of the things that causes this calculation to uh, uh, that can cause it to go bad uh, when uh, when the dip of the ray is changing rapidly. Uh, it can invoke the wrong scheme. So it's a uh, uh, Vidali described it originally as a as a kind of marching cube algorithm, but that that terminology got used to uh, describe a different process. So um, um, let's call it an expanding cube operation. So it begins at the hypocenter here on this uh, 2D grid, and um, and then the uh, uh, we get the uh, um, 
uh, from the hypocenter, you know, it's easy to get these center points. You know, they're just uh, uh, dh uh, time added to zero, and then the uh, crosswise ones. Okay, so uh, we get the the corners, and um, and then uh, we expand from uh, uh, from that uh, uh, first uh, uh, cube to the uh, to the outer one to the next one. Okay. And uh, you've got to resolve what's going on. You know, what is the minimum travel time to from that uh, source to any point uh, along the face and also to the corners? And that's also where we get into uh, uh, some problems in certain models. So we do end up having to, because of the uh, um, the, the problems with some of these uh, schemes, and even you know. Uh, here, uh, you know, we want to we do want to stay away from the larger errors. So, um, uh, at very sharp boundaries, of course, the uh, uh, the rays are changing direction uh, drastically, and uh, so we have to uh, uh, we have to uh, uh, take care to uh, um, you know not use the wrong the wrong scheme in the wrong place. Um, there's another problem, as you might imagine, that, uh, and we've looked at uh, rays that uh, you know come back towards the source, you know, at the at the other side of a low velocity zone, for instance, like a uh, a low velocity basin, and so you have to, uh, uh, you know, purely marching out and purely having exactly one square root per uh, uh, per node doesn't always work. You have to, uh, you know, go. You have to notice when it's not working. Go to the other side of the, uh, um, uh, the other side of the, uh, um, um, the other side of the of the low velocity anomaly, and then march back a ways. Okay, so there's a, uh, and Vidali implemented some of that, uh, and many other people have uh, have implemented. Um, <clears throat> uh, have implemented, uh, um, um, you know, uh, uh, many other uh, many other varieties of this real, you know, really the same algorithm. Still, a, a find a different solution to the uh, the iconal equation. So um, there are, uh, uh, you know, like uh, Satish, uh, John Hole. Um, there are uh, some. There, there are uh, many other very good uh, uh, actual um, actual codes out there. Okay, so um, uh, basically, um, what what Vidali's method gave us is the ability to compute the travel time, you know, at really quite minimal um, minimal expense to anywhere in the model from anywhere else in the model. Okay, um, and we can uh, uh, you know we can afford to do that, uh, and having that complete map of travel times is uh, uh, has some very interesting uses. So we can do you know we might still wonder for tomography we still need those rays right we do, we we want more than more than time for tomography because we need to create that L matrix we need to know the length of of each ray in each block of the model, if we're going to do uh, tomography, or just for uh, examining our uh, our uh, solution, you know, we want to to trace a ray. Okay, so um, it turns out that's uh, and Satish discovered this. It's really quite simple um, once you have the travel time from everywhere to everywhere else in your model. So here's. Um, a model that actually is from uh, Dixie Valley in, in Nevada, um, well constrained by first arrival times down to a uh, uh, little more than half a kilometer depth, and then and then the model is extended down below that for uh, migration purposes. And there's a shallow dipping fault that runs uh, through here, and the um, uh, and this is a, a color coded velocity map here. Uh, in uh, meters per second, <clears throat> um, so uh, we have a source uh, up here on the left side, the uh, the high velocity side, 
and we can project. Uh, notice the uh, topography is here, um, and there are that's the ground surface, and those purple velocities up above are are air velocities, 330 meters a second. Um, so then we uh, project uh, times from that uh, that point, uh, which ha actually happens to be up up on the fault, and uh, we get this is a uh, color view of the times. And then, uh, as I've shown you before in ViewMat, you can take the uh, <clears throat> the modulo of uh, of those times and produce uh, what looks like a, a contour map. So this is a uh, uh, these are 0.1 second uh, time contours, and you can see how close the time the, the contours get together in the uh, in the air, and that's fine. Uh, that gives us uh, a way to ignore it easily. And then here's a, uh, uh, a uh, times from a shot that's out uh, you know way far uh, on the model, and it's still at the surface, so the shot is actually down into the model underneath the air, right here. Um, and so we take these two time maps and point by point at each x and z we add the times, okay, and that produces uh, this uh, view down here. And um, <clears throat> the color scale here runs from the minimum time that we can find in anywhere in the model, and that's uh, one point two four one zero seconds, and um, and then uh, the color scale gets warmer from there. <clears throat> and I think you can notice that uh, the minimum times are these dark uh, uh, dark cells here in the model, and they they seem to trace the ray from the uh, from the source to the receiver, or between the two sources, if you if if you want to look at it that way. Uh, and then here's the uh, uh, you can see the very large travel times up in the air and sort of the medium travel times that are down below. Uh, we can contour that. And um, you know, so here the, our, our, modulus, our modulo is uh, uh, 0.05 seconds, which uh, you know, in picking uh, these data from uh, these seismograms from Dixie Valley, that was about uh, you know, uh, 50 uh, milliseconds um, at those uh, distances, that was about the uh, the pick error that uh, uh, you know maybe we had uh, twenty milliseconds of uh, of pick error. We thought uh, on our uh, <clears throat> on some of our further time picks. So um, uh, you know here's the uh, it's a pretty it's a pretty fat uh, banana uh, that is um, um, defined by the uh, the 50 millisecond uh, time uh, uh, time window on the sum, okay, but there's this broad area in here that's uh, kind of uh, whitish that has some, um, you know, an error that's down below uh, uh, 20 or or even down below 10 milliseconds. So let's isolate that, okay, and let's just pull out what's got uh, an error of uh, of 10 milliseconds. Okay, and I did that just by by clipping the, uh, uh, you know, what's got a, an error of more than ten milliseconds is is just solid white, and then down below uh, ten milliseconds, um, it's um, it's these uh, uh, colors, and what's in blue and purple is you know down below um, three milliseconds. Okay, so even with a kind of a unrealistically small Pick error, we still have this uncertainty over where our ray propagates. Our ray could propagate anywhere within this purple area, which I could call a ray two. Yeah. John, you may have said this. Uh, how did you determine the pick error for this uh, particular data set? That that comes from the data itself. You know, that would be your observation when making the picking. How how accurately do you think you could pick the first arrival times? Is that done somewhat kind of qualitatively? If you yeah. Think you think it is like well maybe there's this much error. Right. Right. Okay. And, and of course this is assuming that I can get an RMS error and I don't you know that I don't have a uh, uh, multimodal error right. I mean if you're if you're subject to phase jumping your error could be you know 
it could be uh, your error is like either you know one millisecond or uh, or or fifty milliseconds, mm -hmm. right? So if you're if you're subject to phase jumping, so I, I'm not considering that. I'm just considering sort of a normal, you know, Gaussian error distribution. And you could use the same thing to kind of look at like the Fresnel zone too, too <coughs> right? For the waves. That's what. Yeah, and in fact, that's. Uh, uh, yeah, if I if I set a uh, a time error, right, right, then uh, then that's what I've got. So um, if I take the whole um, the whole uh, uh, <coughs> um, if I take the whole uh, um, distribution of the uh, of the of the time error, and I kind of invert it, then um, <coughs> Uh, you know, this is this is like a Gaussian view of the ray tube. So, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, along the ray itself, you're on the maximum. You know, got a likelihood of one of uh, being along the uh, uh, the ray, but it doesn't decline from one. You know, right away. You know, one pixel off the off the ray. There's a there's an isolated white pixel. That's the absolute maximum. That's where it's actually equal to one. Um, you know, it's very close to one where it's kind of brownish, orangish here, and then but falling through green, you know, you still got uh, half a chance of uh, of being on the ray, uh, you know, given that Gaussian error. So that's you know, this is this is actually turning it into a ray tube likelihood here. Uh, just and as you can see, this is uh, you know these are all view mat operations. Just uh, some very simple math in in view mat. So if you take that uh, that uh, likelihood and you multiply it by the velocity, then you get uh, you get ray lengths, okay? And you can normalize the ray lengths or not. So you know the unnormalized ray lengths are uh, uh, twenty five. You can nor you know. Um, so so you know these ray lengths top out at uh, twenty five meters. <clears throat> And uh, um, that, uh, which is uh, which is close to the uh, the sample size here, maybe larger than the than the grid size here, um, because it's multiplied by a higher velocity on the left than on the right. Um, so, you know, if you wanted to follow the exact center of that ray tube, then these would be the L's that you would put into your L matrix, your your ray lengths. But you can see that there's more information here than that. And if we populate the L matrix with a normalized ray length, okay, where we've normalized all the lengths by the, uh, the sum of all the non-zero uh, ray lengths that we have, okay, you can see I got the same ray tube geometry, but now I can, I can populate my L matrix with all of the, uh, uh, with everything in the, in the ray tube. Um, so uh, what 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 could that do for me? Well, that can represent the uh, the pick error and and also the kind of slop in the velocity model. You know, I really uh, if if my pick error is uh, you know only uh, ten milliseconds, which is pretty good for this kind of data set, um, I really don't know whether the ray is here or here. I mean, it's got the most likelihood to be in the middle there. Okay, um, but uh, you know I really want to allow the the ray to uh, to wander a bit, <clears throat> and um, so I can do that with this normalized ray length. So I can populate my L matrix where we got dark blue here. The L matrix would be zero, so there's no chance, you know, really no chance of the ray being uh, being in any of those cells, but. These other ones, you know, there's uh, there's more chance here where there's a definite refractor, okay. Then the ray lengths get, get to, the normalized ray lengths get pretty large. They get up to over two meters. Uh, but out here where uh, you know it's kind of a smooth gradient and we we're not uh, the ray tube isn't very well centered. Um, you know the uh, the ray lengths are uh, uh, maybe only uh, are, are le maybe less than half a meter. Um, so we could uh, we could put that into a uh, a uh, um, 
um, an L matrix and do our tomography on that basis. And uh, uh, there's a student named, uh, uh, well, this is one thing that, that Gordon Shields tried in this class, is uh, making a ray tube tomography out of this. Um, and, uh, uh, but he couldn't get it uh, quite far enough. So uh, you know, it's worth, it might be worth another try. Um, the other thing that you can get out of these deterministic travel times are these cases where the, uh, there's multipathing. And uh, this is just an illustration from not, not Dixie Valley reflection data, but uh, uh, data and synthetics from, um, um, <clears throat> from the uh, um, um, from uh, Cantil Valley, from Cocorp uh, Mojave Line 5. And um, uh, on the other side of this fault plane reflection, you'll notice that the, the uh, first arrival and the reflection, okay, they come to the same time in the synthetic and, the, uh, and in, the, uh, in the data. You can see the, the diffraction and the, and the first arrival coming to the same time. Okay? So that's an example of multipathing. Now, this, this is not from that particular situation. It's from, uh, again, Dixie Valley. But you know, I sorted through all the ray tubes, uh, all the source-receiver pairs in Dixie Valley. And I found several examples of, uh, of multipathing. So here's a ray tube uh, that is multipathed. Okay? We got the same minimum time uh, along, uh, along this path as along the path below it, okay? because the path below it is going through higher velocities. So there's a, an example of multipathing, and, and really how easy and automatic it is to pull that out. Uh, you know, and here the, I mean, really the ray tube maybe ought to be, uh, if it was a 10 millisecond uh, uh, thick ray tube, it, it, it ought to be uh, the whole thing. But uh, you know, here I shrank the contour, the ray tube, down to 5 milliseconds, and I could see the multipath quite easy with these larger times you know, in the middle. At the intermediate depths. Okay, so uh, we can get that geometry information, but uh, uh, Satish and, a, and another student at the time, Li Li, um, did some work that uh, also made us not care so much about the um, about getting ray lengths and uh, and doing tomography. Okay, and this is uh, work that they pioneered on, on Monte Carlo optimization. And what time are we getting to here? Okay. So um, uh, we have a lot of problems with linearized inversions. Um, you know, even, even if we get the travel times, we get the, uh, the ray geometries, we get that all correct, uh, and it can all adapt to um, you know, a very rough model. Um, there's just, as, as you'll see in the upcoming lectures, there's just too many problems trying to um, uh, trying to uh, linearize, trying to uh, iterate, um, trying to avoid um, um, uh, false and uh, uh, localized uh, solutions. Um, there's uh, uh, um, there's problems when you try to bring in uh, additional data. Additional constraints, you can't do it directly. Um, you may have trouble uh, composing your uh, your uh, uh, your you know not just your inverse but even your transpose uh, algorithm. Okay, so um, uh, with all of that, uh, you know there's been the idea for many many years that uh, um, if you just uh, you know, so long as you had a, a very fast way of of generating the uh, the travel times, maybe you wouldn't have to invert or even back project at all. You just use a Monte Carlo optimization to um, uh, to uh, determine a uh, a model that uh, that fits the data, and the Monte Carlo optimization requires only forward projection, only the for solving the forward problem. And the ability to calculate errors against data. Um, now, the, the the thing about Monte Carlo is that uh, 
you've got to pretty effectively sample the model space to, to find that low error model. Okay. Now, in seismic tomography, the model spaces are huge. You're going to have at least 100 by 100 blocks. And, and maybe, you know, if you're very parsimonious, you could figure, well, each of those blocks could take uh, one of only 20 distinguishable velocity values. So that model space is 10,000 dimensional, and the number of different models is 10 to the 80th power, uh, different possible models. So that's, uh, that's I, I, and I think that's not just larger than the number of atoms in the universe, it's larger than the number of, of electrons in the universe. Uh, it's larger than the, probably the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons added together in the whole universe. All right? So um, uh, what we're going to do then is, um, uh, is, not, is, is take some kind of uh, strategy in sampling the model space and guiding our, uh, um, our forward modeling, you know, not just on the basis of trying to sample that, you know, trying to effectively sample that uh, you know, 10 to the 80th power number of models, uh, but using uh, uh, it, some approximated natural processes to uh, to guide our uh, our optimization. Okay, so uh, there are uh, two natural processes that have been popular in in guiding optimizations. One is uh, the genetic algorithm, you know, the pro a process of sort of breeding models. And then uh, there's the simulated annealing, which is kind of a crystallization. Uh, it's a model of, of, of crystallization uh, from melt. Um, so two, uh, two natural processes here to, um, um, that, that we can uh, use to guide our, our, uh, um, our, uh, our optimization. So uh, Lee Lee, when she was here, and uh, her advisor Susha Lewis, who's over in computer science, uh, they uh, put together a genetic algorithm for seismic tomography, and it uses uh, instead of the least squares uh, of the uh, uh, RMS for finding error, it just uses the absolute value of the error uh, of the difference between the observed time and the calculated time. Okay, for a particular model, for a particular uh, um, uh, for a particular uh, um, uh, uh, source, particular receiver, particular trace, all of that. Okay, so uh, each uh, in in the genetic uh, algorithm, you set up uh, two hundred uh, different models, and that's the first generation. And uh, you um, you test each of those models, and and um, and then you uh, you mix or interbreed uh, those two hundred models with each other and produce a new uh, you know uh, two hundred child models. Okay, um, and and maybe one reason that uh, uh, the optimization proceeds more slowly than it does with uh, genetics in the real world is that uh, the population doesn't grow. If the population could grow, then um, uh, you know, you'd have a, a much larger stock of models to, uh, you know, your genetic diversity uh, would be larger, and that's always a, a helpful thing in uh, optimization uh, as it is in, uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, for life itself. Uh, but uh, if you keep it to uh, 200 models per generation, then, uh, you know, you get, uh, maybe it's a little too much interbreeding. And there are various ways of, of you know, quote unquote, breeding these models, uh, really just mixing these models together, and um, <clears throat> uh, you know, for this is a uh, a test here um, for uh, a uh, low velocity uh, magma body under uh, under Yucca Mountain, uh, so synthetic travel times projected using Vidali's technique. Uh, through that, and then um, uh, uh, matched with uh, the the lines, which are the uh, the result of the modeling, 
Okay, so you can see the you know very sharp uh, uh, delays that are occurring at uh, at certain offsets. Okay, so Lili was working on a uh, earthquake uh, location problem, an uh, earthquake uh, velocity inversion problem here, um, and she got uh, uh, you know. She was able to attain a low error subpopulation for a uh, two-dimensional tomogram that had a model, you know, that had up to a hundred thousand uh, different cells. Okay, so a dimensionality of a, up to a hundred thousand, and um, uh, so so well. Okay, so here's the perfect uh, data fits. Okay, from the true model. And then uh, here's the uh, result of the optimization, which uh, okay. So we've got the uh, uh, the data as lines and the uh, um, the model results as um, um, uh, as uh, uh, symbols. And I think uh, I think you'd agree that uh, the the model that's down here below. You know that Lili and Sushil Lewis have found an effective way to propose and breed models, uh, and it was fairly efficient. Okay. Um, now there are uh, you know each of the uh, uh, the data points, uh, uh, the smaller ones were uh, weighted down, okay, and the larger ones were uh, um, were weighted more highly, and you can see the larger ones were fit better. The smaller ones were not fit so well. Um, okay, so the, uh, the the let's see, the model must be uh, uh, the uh, uh, the lines and the uh, the synthetic times must be the lines and the data times must be the the points. And so the points, of course, are a cloud, as they always are. The the data points, you know, these are from real pick seismograms. Okay, and um, so uh, this is, uh, um, uh, you know, a solution that fits the highly weighted data uh, uh, quite well. Now, one advantage of the uh, genetic algorithm is that it's highly parallelizable. Okay. Um, now, uh, 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 you know, one of the problems that I noted uh, uh, back when they were doing this was that. You know, in 3D, the dimensionality of the model space is, you know, it's going to be in the millions, and so um, you know, you either need a population size or a number of generations that's just too large, at least for the computers we had at that at those t at that time. So, you know, maybe it's worth trying again um, uh, now that uh, you know we could uh, have easy access to a. a Highly, uh, uh, highly parallel uh, computation facilities. Okay, here's uh, Satish's uh, two references on simulated annealing. So his first paper was actually uh, inversion of reflection times, and the second paper was uh, um, was an inversion of uh, first arrival times. Okay, and they're published in the in the two. Different journals that are interested in the different times. Um, so, uh, uh, simulated annealing considers uh, only one model at a time. It's a completely serial process. Um, so you don't have uh, you know a whole parallel population. Um, and as we found, uh, you know, although uh, you need uh, many more iterations, you know, many more than. You know, we uh, Lee Lee had a population of two hundred, and it took a few hundred iterations. Simulated annealing needs a few hundred thousand iterations. Uh, but since there was only uh, one model at a time being considered, uh, that uh, the 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 computation would would proceed hundreds of times faster. <clears throat> so uh, simulated annealing models the cooling of crystals from a melt. Uh, in this process. Uh, the alignment of movement of atoms de depends strongly on the temperature. From high temperature and a great variety of possible states, you can cool a uh, you can develop a crystal uh, gradually uh, by uh, by cooling from a high temperature to a low temperature. Okay, and and you know crystals uh, 
our low energy states melt as very high energy. Okay, and so uh, crystallization is essentially a uh, a single low energy and uh, as we as we could find our parallel low error state. So uh, we have a working model and we modify it randomly. Again, how we modify it is, is really a critical step. And uh, you constrain each modification so that uh, it's, it's relatively unlikely to wipe out all previous changes. You want to allow that to happen, but rarely. Okay, You've got hundreds of thousands of, uh, of models that you're going to try. <coughs> and you don't want the whole calculation to be reset to, uh, you know, each uh, 100 iterations, that's for sure. So uh, you test each proposed model, and you, uh, you accept it if it passes these conditions that are out outlined by the simulated annealing idea from uh, Metropolis in an early paper in, in geophysics. <coughs> uh, if if the, the error of the new model is less than or equal to, then less than or equal to the error of the, of the Original model of the of the last model, then uh, you always accept it. Your probability acceptance is one. Okay, if the error of the new model is is greater than the error of the previous model, e one is greater than e zero, then <coughs> well, your probability of accepting it is not zero. It's this conditional probability. Okay, so we better start with that on. Thursday.